Hey, this is Ed Rigsby with another Raw and Unedited. So welcome to Raw and Unedited, the place where association executives like you receive tips, tactics, innovation, insight, and solutions, all with the hope and the desire to make you a more effective leader. Have you ever wondered, okay, so you're sitting in the top person's seat, you're the boss, you're going, oh my gosh, if I could just get the team, my staff, my volunteer leaders, my members to have a unifying vision on what this organization is, where we're gonna go, and how we're gonna make things happen. If you've ever wondered that, well, you're in luck today because I have Joe Crisello, who's the author of, here it is, Getting to Us. Joe is a very interesting person. He's uh, become, over a, a period of time, a very dear friend. He is a lawyer. Okay, yeah, we don't need any of the lawyer jokes. And he is an entertainer. And between those two skills, he has an amazing ability to not only influence, but to teach others to influence. So Joe, welcome to the show, and let's ask the question. So if somebody wants to create a unifying vision, meaning an association executive director or CEO, what do they got to do? Uh, number one thing, forget everything you've ever done before, because it's time to think big. The vision has to be bigger than you imagine it could possibly be. And what I mean by that is, what you're doing now is great, but to make it greater, think larger. The bigger you get, the larger you get, the more involvement you will get from everyone else in the association because they will find a place for themselves. They'll find somewhere they can be to achieve the goal. That is the simple beginning of a unifying vision. Okay, so what are the, I, okay, I get that as the, 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 the get-go. So yes. what, are, what are some of the elements? Because as I was reading your book, I found it very fascinating that there's a lot of things and, and, and the things that, um, that kind of struck me that you talked about in here was uh, treating everybody like a human being. Absolutely. Um, if I can, I'll share a story with you. Sure. Um, and it's one of the stories that changed a lot for me. Um, there was, I was a juvenile judge for 10 years here in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. A young man came in front of me. His name was Ken. And he was a pain in the butt. He came in. He would curse me out. I'd yell at him. I'd lock him up. I'd send him back to lock up. He was 16 years old, destined to never be a free person. Well, here's what happened. Every six months he came in, every six months he yelled at me, I yelled at him, they told me how bad he was doing, and he went back to lockup. Well, at 21, the law says he's gotta go free, so four months before his 21st birthday, he came in to see me. Same attitude, same problems, and I said to him, in four months you're getting out. And I said, when you get out, there's two things that are gonna happen. One, I'm gonna see you as a father and a husband somewhere, or I'm gonna see you in lockup someday as an adult. And I just threw my hands up and sent him back to juvenile. About five years later, my secretary tells me there's a guy named Ken in the lobby. I didn't know who she meant. I come down the steps. I looked at him the moment I saw him. I think my first reaction was I'm going to die <laughs> because I locked him up for so many years. And he looked at me and said, can we talk? Thinking I'm going to die, I took him into a conference room to save my secretary's life. We sat in the conference room, he pulls out a picture and shows me a picture of a baby. And he said, I want you to know I'm a dad and I'm getting married on Saturday. Yeah. And I, I just stopped and I said, whoa, back up. What's been going on for five years? And he looked at me and said, you are the only person that ever gave me a choice. Everyone else told me when to wake up, when to work, when to do things, when to sleep. They told me how to live, and I fought against it. You looked at me the last time I saw you and said, the choice is yours. And what Ken chose was what I call the human choice. He realized that if he made the right choice on his own, 
he could be an active member of society. And my theory is simple. If it works for a juvenile delinquent who spent their entire juvenile years in lockup and he was given a chance to be a human being, he will choose it. People will make sacrifices to become part of something big. And for Ken, it was the human race. And that actually shocked me and altered a lot of my thinking and a lot of my management style. And I, over the years, have just developed that into something much bigger. So, you know, Joe, as you're talking about Ken, I mean, that was a great story. When I read that, it just really, um, it, it, it hit me. And I'm, I'm finding myself taking this interview just a little direct, a little different direction now than I thought I would. Um, because of the Ken story, you know, let, let's, let's, let's talk about the malcontents, mm -hmm. the, um, the rebels, the contrarians. Every association or professional society has these outliers. And, you know, I've always kind of believed that if you just include them, they become your most uh, uh, powerful um, allies, friends, uh, mm -hmm. uh, cheerleaders. And you're, you're, you're kind of saying the same exact thing with Ken. So bringing this to an association, so an association executive is trying to get his or her unifying vision. Okay, maybe they get the board member, the board members on board. Maybe they get the staff on board, and maybe there's one or two, you know, uh, uh, rebellious staff persons, and maybe there's a, a handful or a contingent of, you know, discontented, um, disenfranchised members. So, how would you advise if you were sitting in a association CEO's office talking to him or her? And they were to say to you, you know, Joe, the real problem is I've got just a bunch of, of, of contrarians and I just don't know how to, to bring them on board. How, how, would you, how would you help them to do that? Absolutely. Well, first of all, let me say, when people look at someone who's what you call a contrarian, I've been the president of many boards, school boards, uh, president of my bar association, various organizations. We always have those people, and they're not always contrarians. Sometimes they're just struggling to find a place. They want to be somebody in the organization, and they're frustrated when they look at what I call the click. And the board sometimes becomes a click among itself. It's not how it starts, but it gets that way. So dealing with those people, it becomes a mindset. It's easy for you as a board member to look at the other members of the board and see what they can contribute, throw something out, get them to accept it. When someone is contrary, just take a few moments and step back. Find out why they're contrary. The reason that they're contrary may be the fuel that you need to put them in a new direction to carry one part of the organization. Uh, an example that comes to mind for me was when I was the president of the Bar Association. Uh, we had someone who was literally a pain in the neck, just difficult to deal with, um, very demanding, very hardcore, um, stubborn as hell. And when I became president, they said to me, we're going to have a major event at this country club. What do we do? And I thought, wait a minute. I called this person on the phone and said, you're now my chief negotiator. <laughs> Took it and ran with it actually negotiated the best contract we ever had with the hotel because i think they wanted to get her out of there so they gave her everything but what happened was she was no longer contrary because i gave her an external place to be contrary with so every time i had something we had to negotiate on the outside of the association she became my point person and that created in her a sense of belonging a sense of contribution, and she felt like she was serving the bar, doing what she does best. And everybody on the board sat there and went, thank God she's dealing with them because she's not bothering us. So you find what that person really is all about and use that energy to go in a certain direction. 
And everybody is going to contribute if you can take a moment and figure out what they have. You know, Joe, it's, as, as I'm listening to you, I'm kind of uh, taking this personal now because I'm thinking about at uh, the association that we're both members of, the National Speakers Association. I think our new CEO has done that to me. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I, you know, as being the as being the leader of the contrarians and malcontents for 20 years. And now that, that our new CEO is, is, is constantly calling me and asking me questions, it's pretty hard for me to, to rebel against anything. No, because you're, but exactly my point, you are giving input and it makes you feel valuable. And even though we're having this conversation, <laughs> you're still going to take his calls tomorrow because you have a say in the big picture. Yeah, that's pretty cool. You know, um, I, I jokingly say my book was originally going to be entitled How to Get People to Do Things That They Are Not Inclined to Do. Yeah. Um, yeah. And really, that is the message of how he's, yeah, and I frankly, I think that's how he's treating you, but it's working. Pretty funny. <laughs> it works for everybody. So, you know, in your book, you mentioned your book that, you know, how to get people to do what you want to do. Um I found it interesting reading the chapter. I'm kind of struggling for words here, and I'm a speaker. That's fascinating. Um, in the respect that the book, the, the, the chapter on, on getting to know myself. Yes. That was a pretty powerful chapter. And it, 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 it really made, it made me take pause and do some thinking about myself. And so not only, I would assume, every executive director or CEO that's running an association probably should take pause. But, but is this something that can be institutional? I mean, you know, how would the, um, the organization mm -hmm. as a whole take pause and make sure they know themselves? Oh, well that, okay. I mean, first of all, every individual on the board should have a grasp of who they are. And that's an easier process to work with each individual. The problem is some people's skin is too thin to hear what people think of them. Um, in a lot of organizations, I was the president of the school board for years. And uh, someone once told me before I became president that the problem with the board was it was a Roman turtle. And if you're I don't know what a Roman turtle. turtle. Yes, the Roman turtle was in the old Roman warrior days all of the soldiers would gather with their shields on the outside in a circle. Protect. Oh, like, like we saw in the movie Spartacus. Yes, in Spartacus. That is a Roman turtle, and nobody could get to the inner core. Well, the problem is, when you can't see past that wall, it's a mystery. It's threatening. It, it's scary. They don't know what's going on inside that board because everyone has surrounded it and it's impenetrable. It becomes, in modern day words, it's just not transparent. Well, that board should figure out what its identity is to the membership. Does the membership respect the board? Does the membership like the board? What are they, how are they communicating with the membership to tell the membership what's going on? And is the membership seeing them as a threat? Because if you look at it, and that's what I mentioned earlier about the feeling of a click, people think they can't get into that click because they don't want to hear from me. They just want to tell me what's going on. They want to tell me what to do. And if they realize that that's how they look, they realize that they're um, threatened or panicked, or the board may just seem like an arrogant entity that just sh shouts out orders. They have to know that. Because once they know their reputation among the members, then they can alter it. Yeah, the, no, it's very common, I've seen. I was just gonna say, let me just oh. throw back to one thing. The best way to find out how a board looks is to interview your malcontents. Sure, okay. So let's go backwards and say, they'll tell you. You know, I, I've seen for years, and, and, and I see this as almost a, a common uh, situation in organizations that I've been a consultant for or I belong to, you know, the board seems so regularly, I won't say frequently, I'll say so regularly to be insular. I mean, you know, like, uh, just use uh, 
kind of a debacle at the National Speakers Association as an example. You know, several years ago when they decided we're going to rename the organization Platform, and they they didn't survey anybody. They just um, they just decided one day. They and, assumed they knew best. Well, yeah, and when I were um, when I was interviewing uh, one of my close friends who was on the board, I, I said to him, um, I said, "What happened?" And I mean, how 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 was it that you guys were so off base that you, you, you know, he goes, you know, we really thought that the members were going to like this. And, and it, it just, it was so evident that here's a board of directors that has no clue what the membership wants because it insulates itself regularly and it becomes, I hate to use this word, but it becomes incestuous and when a, you've got a situation where you don't have a popular vote, you've got an internal uh, selection system, it becomes very incestuous because, you know, who they are breeds more of who they are. So, so how does a board, what, what are your, maybe I, I should put this in, in more tips. How would you advise a board to be more um, transparent beyond just the simple survey. Okay, so they take a survey and they find out that, hey, the, the members think we're elites, the members think this, the members think that. So what would be some steps that after they've done this survey that the boards could do to, to become more transparent, to maybe, um, you know, be more, uh, 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 you, know, you know, from the group you rose, you arose and to the group you will return. Mm -hmm. And so they've arisen from the group for a period of time and they'll return to the group for a period of time. But for that time when they've arose, how, how do they, how do they become more transparent? Yeah, there's a number of ways and it's going to depend obviously on the size of the organization. Okay. Because in a smaller association or a, an event that is smaller, it's easier. And obviously in a bigger one, it's going to be bigger, but let me start with uh, what we used uh, for one of our events was we had a dinner and it was a meet the board dinner. And I was the MC and brought everybody in, but I specifically sat one of each of the 16 board members and then myself as 70 president at a different table with the members so that the members were all told board member at your table, they're going to bring it back to us. And those members, some members were brutal on the board members, some sucked up and were pansies and lied. But for the most part, we got a lot of honesty from the people about what the board looked like to the members. And the members that showed up, by the way, because it was an open invitation to the membership, the members that showed up were the ones that have the most to complain about in the, for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, and the ones that didn't get any good information were the ones that were just there because they show up at everything. We tried to separate and place them accordingly to make that work. In a bigger uh, association, and I hate to use the phrase, but taking a lesson from politics, town hall meetings, having an event where you're allowing the membership to speak out and tell the board or tell the president or the executive director what they're seeing and creating an open dialogue. Um, on the negative side, I proposed that to an organization. And um, I have to tell you, it was interesting because they got a room, they had about 80 or 90 people in the room. The president's up in the front with the executive director and not what I told them. They had paper where people had to write their questions and send them forward. And as I'm watching, I realized to my right, the woman who was passing them to the executive director was screening the questions. And then they wanted to know why it didn't work. And I tried to tell her, give them all to him. Give him a bad one just so I can see what he does with it. She wouldn't do it because he said to her, only give me the good ones. That doesn't work. You've got to be willing to take it. Uh, one of the problems with self-evaluation is you don't want to hear it. You don't want to hear what people think of you. 
But if you don't let them tell you, you're not going to grow. You're going to stay the way you are. Um, in fact, I, I, I jokingly say years ago as a trial lawyer, I know me, I walk into a courtroom, I'm a big imposing figure and basically standing in front of a jury in a small town in Pennsylvania, I look like a big city hitman that was brought in. I know what I look like. I know how they saw me. Um, and it was painful because it's the way I look. I had to change my demeanor to speak to the jury. So they realized I was just as regular as them and that I'm not a big, scary, imposing figure. But if I didn't pay attention to what they thought of me, I would have failed in the trial. And by the way, the way I learned was I got to the town a week early and I had breakfast, lunch, and dinner in local restaurants, in local bars, and I let people in the town tell me how they felt about me showing up. And it was painful, you know? Oh, you look like a big fat Italian from the city. Uh, yeah, that's, that's me, welcome to my world. But the point is, you don't wanna hear it, but all of that became valuable when I communicated a message to that jury and they accepted me as one of theirs. You've got to be able to take the punches and come through them and then you can deliver. You've just gotta be willing to do that. And any board, um, they all wanna look like they're important. They all wanna look like they're somebody. And let's face reality, a lot of people serve on boards because it looks good on their resume. And the last thing they want is controversy. Frankly, your board has to be willing to take controversy. So they have to have thick skin. Got it. So, you know, um, so if, the, if, if, if we can, you know, create using some of these tools you've thrown out at us a bit of a unifying vision and you know it, it's almost um incumbent at least most organizations believe it's incumbent upon them to grow whether they need to grow or not they all believe they need to grow so you know what is it that that we have to do to influence people in the industry that, or the profession, whatever the case may be, that, that haven't yet come into the fold. How, how do we need to do that today differently maybe than we did it years ago? Um, give them something that makes them feel like they're contributing. And I'll explain, that's a simple statement. People want to contribute. In fact, this morning on Facebook, I got three people's birthday messages that say, donate money for my birthday. Everybody wants to make a difference. Now, when you look at an association, it used to be you've got cocktail receptions, you've got conventions with uh, hospitality rooms, you gave people something to come network, party, and bond. Now they can network from their own home. They can network via text message, internet, LinkedIn, Facebook, I don't care, they, they can do it at home. That's not the draw. The draw is what difference can your association make in the industry as a whole that people want to be a part of? And it has to be an all-inclusive vision. So I don't care what your association is. The question is, you've got to accept the fact that associations don't exist solely for networking anymore. So they have to decide that they want to create something bigger in the industry where they are instrumental, the association, in blowing the top off. Um, and to do that, you have to include everybody. And I'm just gonna make my um, personal dagger here, which is always, I don't care what generation they come from. I am adamant about the fact that there is no millennial problem. And there is no generational problem. There is nothing out there that is real about that. It is a management problem. It's a failure to listen and it's a failure to pay attention. Um, when I speak, one of the things I've asked audiences and just Friday I asked an audience, um, I asked baby boomers to tell me what they thought the number one problem with a millennial was. And they told me they wanna work from home. And I just giggled and said, then explain to me if that's a problem exclusively to baby boomers, I mean to millennials, how did the baby boomers 
drive the multi-level marketing business under the dreams of being able to work from home. The baby boomers wanted to work from home, but they forget that. They don't remember that that was our dream when we started. So now they look and hold it against the millennials. What we have to do is actually remember who we were, how we got here and respect everybody. We might have invented the technology that millennials use, but millennials are masters at using it. We may have come up with some great processes that we put into place, but now they're the birthright of the millennials who will help boom it. So you've got to take what I call the whole spectrum from the, the, the people that are still working from the silent generation all the way through to the newbies and the Gen Z, put them all in one pot and take from all of them and let them all contribute. And everyone has to contribute evenly because if no one, if, if there's everyone is swimming in the same direction, you're going to have progress. The minute you leave somebody stranded, they're going to wander off. So, yeah, you know, that's interesting because um, not to name any names, but there's a whole lot of people out there that are speakers and consultants that have made a ton of money from polarizing rather than galvanizing generations. And as long as they can polarize and point out the differences, they have a reason to come speak at a conference. Right. You're here suggesting that we galvanize. Do you know how much money you're going to take out of the pocket of a lot of consultants if association executives listen to you? I mean, you're going to be responsible for them not being able to eat. No, because not everyone's going to believe me and they're going to keep hiring everybody else. <laughs> I accept that. Um, I mean, I still get arguments with it all the time. People tell me I'm wrong. I personally don't believe so. And I've seen it. I've seen my theories work. You know, it's fast. It's fascinating because I was got into a, I'll just call it strong conversation with one of the members of my mastermind group out here where I live. And um, he teaches innovation and he's all about the, the, the generation thing. And I, and I was, cause I wrote a piece um, six months ago that, you know, be a, be a, be wary of all the uh, generational experts because as you said, you know, when we think, I mean, I graduated high school, I hate to say this and admit this in front of everybody, but I graduated high school in 1970. And, you know, at that point it was, we were rebelling against our establishment and we wanted our freedom. And, you know, we wanted to be in the CEO suite tomorrow. Mm -hmm. How different is that from many of the millennials today? Same exact thing. It's not different at all. That's, you know, it may, but people like you and I, and I want to say we're a bit self-aware. We know when we're miserable. We know when we're cantankerous. We also know when we're fun. We, ex we understand ourselves. We don't forget our histories. I know how I was when I first became a lawyer. I know how I was when I first walked into a courtroom because from day one, I wanted to be the owner of that room. I wanted to own everything. Wait a minute. That's what people are telling me millennials want. But I remember doing it myself going, I'm just as guilty. Sure. You know, but the truth is we all are. Um, you know, I, I, I just want to say when I talk about it and I'm going to refer to some comments I made in my book, but I always look at revolutionary wars uh, that are really one of the greatest unifying visions that exist. In the U.S., our revolutionary war the, was based on the final phrase, as I call it, the final phrase of the Declaration of Independence, which says, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. There's nothing left. Everybody pledged everything they had. And the Civil War, I mean, such as a Civil War, the Revolutionary War, was won by your, I, I call Gen Z of Sybil Ludington, Betsy Ross, who was a millennial, John Paul Jones, head of the Navy at 29. There's your superstar millennial. And then you've got in the middle from the baby boomers, you've got George Washington, you got Ben Franklin, 
And then at the very end of the spectrum, the silent generation would have been Samuel Whitmore at 79 going into battle. Nobody said, oh, we have to worry about generations. We have to worry. No. The cause was so big that everyone found their part in it. And nobody said, John Paul Jones is 29. Why should he be the head of the Navy? No, he was good at it. So reality is everyone can contribute if you give them a moment. I don't care if they're generation X, Y, Z, baby boomer. I don't care if they're malcontents. I don't care if they're supporters. Everyone will contribute and give. And that is my belief. So, Joe, let me ask this. Getting back to the association executives sitting there watching this video, hoping to get tips, tactics, innovation, insight to make him or her a better association executive. Um, what are your thoughts? I mean, let's bring it back down to the paid, what, what in the association world we like to call the chief staff executive, the paid top person mm -hmm. that ultimately, I, I think that we both um, acknowledge that they need to be the bearer of, of the torch. They need to be, you know, the, the president changes every year or two. And, right. and, and hopefully the executive director doesn't change too frequently. Um, so talking to that paid top paid person, you're sitting across the desk, they're paying you the big bucks to be their consultant. You know, what would you say to them if you're looking at an organization and, and they're going, you know, we're doing okay, but I think we could do a heck of a lot better. What would be the three areas you'd have them start to work on? Okay. Um, and let me say the three areas are going to be three personality types. Because what I would want them to do is just start off small. Pick six people that you consider to be the, what I call the most powerful leaders and contributors in the association. Pick six people who are your constants. They may not do a lot, but they're always there. They're always in the woodwork somewhere. And then pick the six people that make you the most miserable. Interview 18 people. Six, six, and six. Interview them. What's the middle six? The, the ones that are just always there. They're not the high-end leaders, but they're always there when you turn around. Okay, maybe, maybe I didn't get it. So you got... You got your, the high, your leaders, your, your... Let me do it this way. Your funnel into the top leaders. For instance, people in the chain of command moving up through the ranks to president. And then the people that are always just there that never run for office. And the last one would be the ones, the malcontents, the okay. ones that complain. Gotcha. Just take six from each category. And I say six because usually you're going to have a president, president elect, vice president, secretary, treasurer, and um, somebody else should take those. And then you just take six people. When you look around at an event, you always see these same six people showing up. And then all of a sudden, you've got six people that you hate talking to. And that's the ones that will kill you. They're the ones that are like cold calls, you know, because you've got to be willing to start somewhere. Call these people. Interview them. Ask them what they believe the organization is doing for them, what they believe they're doing for the organization, and what they would do better if they we're wholly driving the organization. What is it they would be looking for? Ask all those people that single question. And do not interrupt them. Don't challenge them. Don't let yourself feel threatened because they're saying something contrary to what you're doing. But find out what those three columns are thinking because that will be a process that you can now start wondering, what do I find in common? that I can help pull together this team. Because chances are, if you do those interviews and you pick your people right, your malcontents could very well shift into the leadership track because you find out they have something to offer. Or you might motivate the people in the middle rather than just the noisy ones that want to keep moving up. You may find valuable people that you can filter in. So that, was, that is where I would start. I'd want to know what those people do now. You know, frankly, I'd be more than happy to do those interviews for people. But 
that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> I think people need to do that themselves in all honesty. Sure. They, they need to hear. Yeah. It's, um, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's hard to, uh, to listen. It's the old, uh, three on three. Tell me three things you like about how I manage you. Now tell me three things you don't like about how I manage you. And the first three, you keep your mouth shut. And the second three, you keep your mouth shut. Yeah, I, I, I get that. I, no, and, and, and I'll tell you, I mean, I once, when I started off as an entertainer, um, I did a couple stage shows and a few friends of mine were in the audience. And I basically looked at them and said, I want to know everything I did wrong. And if you don't think I did anything wrong, we're not friends anymore. <laughs> and they all stared at me. And by the way, one of them is no longer a friend. The other two brutally tore me apart and made me better. Um, so, so Joe, you know, you're sitting across from this association executive and they're going, okay, I, I get this. I get some of the things to fix internally to make us better. Uh, I would call it to maybe make it a more member ROI centric organization. But then they're, they're thinking, okay, I, I got the idea that you said, you know, create something to make people a part of to get them to join. But I mean, how are we going to get the non-member to even show up to an event, to even consider this? I mean, basically, you know, I, I guess you'd call it sales 1A. I mean, how are, how are we going to, if I'm the association executive, I'm talking to you, okay, Joe, you want me to put on an event? You know, you, you want us to, to talk about, you know, how we're bigger than ourselves, how we're going to, you know, save the world or, you know, whatever it is we're going to do, you know. Um, and... Uh, okay, that's good, and I'm on board, but how are we going to get them there? Well, you know, it, it's an interesting process, but uh, for years I argued to a jury, and my objective was to convince the whole jury. But I couldn't argue to every one of the 12 because they were all different. So what I tried to do is argue down the middle to the people that I saw as the strongest forces the people that I saw as the most significant players on that jury based on their histories. And they were the ones that I then counted on to pull in the other jurors to give me my verdict. In an association, I believe the same thing works. If you direct your message down the middle and you hit your power players, they're going to reach out and pull people in to remind them this is good. This is, this is a part I think you can play because it's not a matter of uh, reaching every single person on earth. It's reaching one person who tells two friends who tells two friends. But if they can describe what the association is doing, it will be easier to bring in friends. We just launched a campaign here for a foundation that I'm a member of. The foundation never really had an identity. Um, and it was one where people looked at it and went, it's a bunch of lawyers on a foundation. Why do we want to give to a bunch of lawyers? Well, we remodeled the foundation now to the We Care About Children Foundation. Because really what we're doing is funding the uh, child custody lawyers in the uh, pro bono area or the uh, low income area. We're funding those lawyers that are helping these people. Well, when people try to say we're funding a lawyer, it doesn't work. But now all of a sudden people are realizing, oh my God, we care about children. We care about the kids. What they're doing is they're providing lawyers to help the kids. That message is now allowing that foundation to spread because people are okay telling their friends, hey, your business is looking to contribute, we're helping children. The message changed, so it's slowly growing over time. And I believe it's going to be an incredibly successful campaign when it's done. But that is how an association has to look at it. What is it you're aiming for? Where are you going? And why do your members want to brag about being a part of it? Because the more they brag, the more members you get. So you're really talking about creating a unifying vision. That's it. So, Joe, <laughs> um, here, I, I want to give you a, a minute or two commercial um, so if you're an association executive and you want to bring Joe in as a consultant or as a keynoter, uh, getting to us, or if you look over his right ear and you oh, yeah. see his book, what's the freaking point? 
that's a book on um, uh, presentation skills that I've read. It's a very good book. Um, also, what, what's very interesting, and, you know, sometimes it's like, when I say this, people go, really? You know, Joe is also an entertainer. He's a mentalist. And, um, and, and you watch him work, and it's fascinating. And also, he's a magician. Now, you know, he does those things because they're fun, and he enjoys it. It's kind of his hobby. But his true expertise is helping you to influence others, whether yeah. it's having a, a proper presentation, uh, whether it's to be able to influence people as he did as a lawyer, or whether it's to bring your organization together with a unifying vision, or whether it's to help your members to bring a unifying vision to their organization. Joe's the guy to do it. So Joe, if somebody wants to get a hold of you, um, rather than them having to Google you, because they probably couldn't spell your last name if they tried, um, and I will have in the description on, on this YouTube video, uh, Joe's uh, link to his website, but uh, tell everybody how to get a hold of you. Uh, easy enough. Just uh, go to themindshark.com. T-H-E-M-I-N-D-S-H-A-R-K. Uh, that is my website. Or if you can spell Crisillo, please type in joecrisillo.com. It'll take you to the same place. And when you get there, you'll find my website, which has my programs. It's got my books. But the main thought I like to leave people with is Ed says, you know, mind reading and mentalism is my favorite thing to do because I love reading people. I love working with people. But I ask you as a leader, the simple question I end with is, if you could read minds, can you imagine what you could accomplish? And my goal is to see you challenge the impossible and be able to understand how to create a unifying vision by reading minds, by understanding one thing. People are all human and they all want the same thing. You've got to get them to that place. That's super. Joe Crisillo, thank you so much for being Thanks, here. Sam. It's been wonderful. Thank you.